and welcome to Inside Albania with me, Alice Taylor. This week, I'm continuing the conversation on human trafficking and mass migration out of Albania and into the UK. I'll be joined by three special guests to drill down into the facts of trafficking and whether the British government is failing in its obligations. I'm also going to discuss with two US expats living in Albania the recent visit by former President Bill Clinton and Albanian patriotism for the US. Over the last year, thousands of Albanians have gone to the UK to seek asylum, causing outrage in the media and the parliaments of both countries. But one of the most concerning aspects of the situation, for me at least, is the issue of children going missing from UK asylum hotels. When asylum claims are being processed, applicants, including unaccompanied minors, were being placed in hotels rented by the British government. It came to light that over 400 children went missing from these hotels, with at least 176 of them being Albanian. Now, on a previous episode of Inside Albania, I questioned Conservative MP Tim Lawton on the matter, and I asked if the government knows where these children are. The MP, as a true politician, defended the situation by saying many were 16 to 17 years old, which is still a child in the eyes of the British law, I may add, and that they were mainly boys. While he was unable to say where they were or detail any efforts to find them, he did say the following. Those children, and they are children, but they are older teenagers, uh, have chosen to leave the hotels, in many cases have gone to family, friends and contacts, but in some cases uh, may well be working with uh, traffickers and in criminal um, Do you gangs. know where they are? Because now, surely stands, you can't say that if stands, you don't know where they are. As it stands, as it stands at the moment... Uh, as we heard from the Home Secretary in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee on Wednesday, there are zero children in hotel accommodation for asylum seekers in the UK. They have now all been placed in foster care at great expense, specialist foster care, uh, where they can be looked after. Yes. But again, they are free to abscond if they choose to. That's the but they're still children of how we in the eyes of the things. law. And do they you are... know where they are? It, like, what's uh, been done to find them? We're... You don't know where they are. OK. <laughs> But just days after Tim's comments, it came to light that a Brighton hotel where up to 136 children vanished from previously would be brought back into use by the Home Office. The site reportedly started welcoming more youngsters as of 27th of June, despite the fact many of those who disappeared from it before still being missing. The matter of the missing children became subject to legal action brought by charity ECPAT UK, who argue that the Home Office has no authority to place unaccompanied children in asylum hotels. The NGO is also challenging Kent County Council's derogation of duties to children in need, and they call an end to putting minors in such establishments due to issues of emotional abuse by hotel staff and some being subject to human trafficking, and of course, a failure to meet their basic needs. <laughs> With me today, I have Patricia Burr, the CEO of ECPAT in the UK. Good afternoon, Patricia. Thank you for joining us on Inside Albania. My first question to you is, your, you and your organisation have recently filed legal action against the British government over the issue of um, children being kept in these so-called asylum hotels. Um, now, I know you can't really talk too much about the specifics of the case, but what I want to know is, in your view, what obligations do the British government have to underage, sort of under the age of 18 asylum seekers? Um, this is in terms of national law, international conventions, and what, in your view, have they violated? Thank you. Yes, yeah. For the first time in our history, ECPAT UK are taking um, legal action of this nature. And that's because we're so concerned about the breach of children's um, rights, both, as you say, under our domestic law and also um, international convention. Um, but just to focus in on our domestic law, um, the principle really is that any child who um, is in the UK should be treated as a child first and foremost. 
um, our domestic legislation is well advanced in respect of child protection, child safeguarding and welfare. We have a well established um, piece of law called the Children Act 1989, which determines that um, any child in a local authority area who is in need should be assessed by that local authority and provided with the, um, the what, whatever that child needs really to enable them to have a, a, a good kind of um, good health and good well-being. Um, and in respect of unaccompanied children, of course, their principal need is for care. They are children who are um, separated um, here alone without um, an adult that that certainly when they first arrive that we are aware of who could look after them with, with some sort of parental responsibility. And therefore they are in need of um, a, a response that focuses both on their protection, but also on their need for um, a care and um, a, a home. Um, so what we want to see happening to those children is that they are take, taken in by local authorities who have social workers who can assess needs and make placements that are in the best interests of those children. And that's currently what is not happening in respect of the Home Office, the British Government Home Office, placing children directly into hotels, which um, I think is not just our view, but I think have been, have been um, kind of looked at from the point of view of being unsuitable for children and they're certainly not registered under our under our domestic um, legislation. Is it, I mean obviously the number of Albanian children being high could be linked to the fact that a vast majority of those seeking asylum are Albanian but are there any other reasons here you think why Albanian children are going or were going missing in such high numbers from these hotels? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we need to take one step back and say that what's happening here at the moment is a complete conflation of our immigration um, matters with um, matters to do with trafficking. So um, obviously our main concern as FPAT UK, Every Child Protected Against Trafficking, is, 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 is that, is that um, we are concerned that children who are being exploited and trafficked are, that they're, they're, they're kind of, being lost into a, into a system. Now, I'm not saying all of those children have been, but the the lack of attention to the specific situations of each and every one of those children is causing some difficulties, I think. So any child can be trafficked. British national children are trafficked within the UK. Um, children are trafficked into the UK. They are also trafficked en route. Um, so. The, the matter of um, seeking asylum is obviously fundamental to their, um, their, their staying in, in the UK, but also the trafficking matter needs to be looked at separately. So in terms of Albanian children, um, yes, that is hugely concerning that the majority of those children are Albanian. And I think what we need to do as the grown-ups, as the officials and the, the kind of uh, professionals responsible for those children is to seek to understand why that is the case and what actually is happening rather than making assumptions about what that means. Um, so I know that with the illegal migration bill that's going through our parliament at the moment, Albania is now deemed to be a safe country, meaning that um, the British government doesn't consider an asylum claim from Albania to be of merit. Um, in relation to children, what we want to see is every single child's um, si a specific situation looked at and looked into. Um, we don't know exactly what's happened to every one of those children, but we certainly shouldn't be making assumptions about it. We do know that children um, can be trafficked here. They, they also, when they go missing, every single child that goes missing is of a huge concern to us, because until we know what's happened to them and until they're found, we cannot assume what has happened to them. So we need to be looking for them. We need to understand where they've gone and why. And we need to understand um, some of what we know. We've got some intelligence to say that some of those children have been trafficked within the UK and have been found in other areas of the country um, with uh, criminals who are seeking to exploit them. And that is a huge concern. 
And this is something, I mean, I, I interviewed that MP on the, on the show previously, and sort of one of his arguments, I mean, I interpreted which is one of his arguments was that um, many of these children who went missing were male, aged between 16 and 17, and left of their own accord. So they absconded, I believe is the word he used. And this was sort of a semi-justification in a way that he presented. Um, so d does this mean if you're a boy, you're 17 years old, and you choose to leave a hotel, does that mean you're automatically not going to be at risk of trafficking, slave labor? I mean, what risks do these children face, even if they're leaving voluntarily, as much as a minor can, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I, I just reiterate, any child who goes missing is of concern. Um, our law deems that child, a, a child is somebody under the age of 18. So, um, and I don't subscribe to the view that we should care less about boys, that we should care less about 16 and 17 year olds, um, and that they're at less risk. And I don't subscribe to the view either that a child seemingly to choose to leave somewhere where they're meant to be being looked after should be taken at face value, or that there isn't an element of exploitation, manipulation, coercion and control yes. behind that choice. I would also say that children um, run away or leave uh, either because they're pushed away or because they're being pulled towards something else in general. Um, and I would say that's one of the reasons why we're very concerned about the hotels, because we know that criminals know where their hos those hotels are, so they know that there are children there. We know that um, there are concerns about how children, how safe children feel there, how, um, how well their needs are being met. And all of those factors can create a situation where a child may make, a, you know, what seeming, seems to be quite a rational choice to leave. But we need, we have, we have procedures here about children going missing, which requires us to both look at their welfare when we find them, but also to do a, 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 an interview with them to find out what's happened you know, what are the, the factors that have led to the situation that they're in? Because we know how vulnerable and accompanied children are already. And we know that any child um, who goes missing is of, is of huge concern to us. Yes. Um, and, and until we know what's going on, we should never make an assumption. Essentially, the risk that is presented to these, these children um, regardless of whether they're two days away from being 18 or not, you know, it doesn't matter whether they're male, female, um, or what age they are, the risk is still very present. Thank you, Patricia. Please do stay, um, because now we're going to sure. talk to uh, Sister Imelda Poole, um, who is the president of Mary Ward Loretto NGO, uh, which has been working to transform the lives of those who have been trafficked or are at risk of exploitation in Albania for almost 20 years. Uh, good afternoon, Imelda, and thank you for joining me today on Inside Albania. Good afternoon, Alice. Thank you. Now, uh, we know from recent US State Department reports and various other reports from all different kinds of organizations that Albania does not meet the basic requirements to prevent human trafficking and to deal with the issue of human trafficking. And this situation has been going on for a very long time. Progress has been sluggish, shall we say. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the situation regarding the trafficking of women, girls, boys and men, be it sex trafficking, slave labour, etc., out of Albania? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think the first premise we need to look at is the law itself. Um, Albania's laws are often in writing the best. In fact, there is no one law against human trafficking with all the uh, parts of the law which protect the victim, which are trauma-informed, which are human rights-based law. There is no one law. So a lawyer in Albania who is trying to gather the threads of human trafficking and the manner in which men, women, girls and boys are trafficked, it's almost impossible because they've got to be creative with the law because there is no defined. So we're having a conference in October with our networking partners in Eurat to actually lobby and to bring out this absolutely 
unbelievable issue that there is no one human law here against human trafficking. When people come back here, if people are being sent back, um, let's say, you know, maybe they, their asylum claim has been rejected, they are victims of trafficking, be it working in a car wash or as a prostitute, being forced to work as a prostitute, um, and they've been sent home because the British government has said, well, we don't believe you, well, that's not correct. What risks present themselves? What issues, aside from the justice thing, so at a family level, a societal level, a, a job level, um, and in terms of coming face to face with these criminals again, what risks are there for these mm. people? Very important question. The, the, the first thing to note is that the reception centre, which would have housed over 100 of these returnees, is now under construction. I think there's only about nine or ten places. The others, because we have some lawyers over from Britain asking these questions, mm -hmm. when we put together all of the possibilities from the other three, four shelters, children's shelters and shelters that would go up to any age as it were, um, there was only that day 12 places free. So imagine if there is a huge influx mm -hmm. of returnees who need, and they're in trauma as you said, they're going to need a huge gentle accompaniment through trauma to be able to even speak their truth. They will have disassociated they will not even be able to identify the actual truth from the unreality. You understand? Yes. So trauma-informed means giving people time in a safe environment with a good counsellor to come to some kind of sense of freedom and strength and hope to tell their truth about their story of the trafficking uh, journey, if you like. And then you've got the stigma. You talked about mm -hmm. going home. Well, we know that because culturally we're in a society that to do the, the normal, to go home and be safe in your family unit, is not the norm here. Because once a girl has been sexually abused, even if it was forced, a multiple rape, if they're forced into street work, mm -hmm. they still have the stigma on them because they're not available for the future Yes. husband so the reconciliation with the family which would be the role of the carers the workers in the shelters or ourselves that accompany the victims day to day if they're not in shelters it could take a year some do open their doors yes for sure and they're safe once that happens but it's painful that journey is so painful I mean, yeah, this is on a psycho, psychological level, on an economic level, it's challenging, but also what is the risk of people being re-trafficked? Do you know what the, if there's a statistic or anything, how many people are re-trafficked or at least attempted to be re-trafficked once they return? Do you know there's no statistics of who's trafficked, never mind re-trafficked. We know that probably it's 10% of people that are named, say, in the TIP report traffic because we know so many fall through the gaps especially yes. in the UK because that's where I work as well cross-border as does our foundation in Albania because we um, give therapy mm -hmm. for Albanians in shelters in the UK online um, that's part of our commitment in a partnership with the Medai Trust and there we see that in fact you know the the whole um, freedom you might say of that that a uh, journey back to Albania is, is, is very difficult to analyse in terms of statistics because even directors of shelters have told me in the UK because of the law they have to let go, not, not, not of many but some because they're not defined or it's not clear of their status mm -hmm. so they end up homeless. We've had phone calls from the UK of girls that have been trafficked that are homeless, living on the streets, they've been vulnerable to the re-trafficking, they've been re-trafficked, they're back on the streets. And we've, we've been working with organisations in Britain where a girl has been in deportation status in Heathrow Airport. And we've brought in other organisations because we know that girl had a hospital appointment and in fact was very sick. But yes. she was not allowed to keep the hospital appointment, she was just taken 
to Heathrow Airport. In the end, she was put in a London hospital because online we were negotiating with the other organisation and the police then understood. But it's very complex. Yes. It, it's not, you know, people will never truly understand the truth of human trafficking because it's unseen. It's a hidden crime. It's with the vulnerable and the most poor. And who wants to know? Mm -hmm. And who wants to claim it in a government? To claim the numbers? Is my last question, just, just briefly. So the British government has been very quick to downplay the risk of trafficking, um, especially when it comes to men and boys as well. Um, they are not very concerned about people in asylum hotels. This is my perception anyway, and I'm being polite. Um, briefly, what, how does this make you feel as someone who's dedicated a big chunk of their life to working to support these people? Hmm. Well, I think I heard you talking earlier about you know, young boys being taken from hotels and, and where is the root of that. The saddest thing is that there isn't an acknowledgement that the traffickers are more intelligent than any of us in their corporate ways of working and that they will get in where there is an opportunity to move vulnerable people by persuasion or whatever into what could have been for them hope but was despair when it came to the crunch because they were taken into clandestine a brutality um, and, and clandestine work that was grim, dark, and has led to many thousands and millions of young people losing their self-esteem, losing their identity, losing their opportunity for a life, and it's from that that workers such as us at Mary Ward Loretto are trying and struggling to bring life from, from death, really, and, and light from darkness. So, uh, yeah, it's a complicated question you're asking, and you ask for a simple answer, but that's what I give. Yeah. Thank you very much, Imelda, for your time today and the work that you're doing as well. I really Thank appreciate you. it, and I appreciate your time as it's well. It's been a pleasure and an honour. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, this week, the UK's Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, was forced to withdraw controversial rules which were aimed at trafficking victims who arrive in the UK via irregular means. Now, these rules would require each victim to be able to provide immediate evidence of them being trafficked in order to be recognised as a victim. Now, these were withdrawn and replacement rules are due to be announced on the 10th of July. Uh, also this week, the UK's House of Lords voted to amend the UK's much lauded Small Boats Bill, which would limit detention times for pregnant women and children seeking asylum. And the amendments would also stop LGBTI individuals from being deported if they're at risk of persecution in their home country. <laughs> I also have with me freelance journalist and commentator Benedict Spence. Uh, Benedict, you've been rather outspoken on this issue in the British media, saying that people from Albania are coming to, from a safe country, they're hijacking the refugee crisis. Um, but as you've heard from the other people we've spoken to today, um, there isn't actually really one law in Albania against human trafficking, which means that it's very hard for victims who are returned to get any justice. And we've also heard we, what appears to be a drastic failure on the part of the British government to protect children and youngsters once they arrive in England. Um, can you give me an overview of your opinion of the situation in general, but also these two facts? So... Broadly speaking, across the state of migration in the UK, I mean, everybody knows that it's a bit of a dumpster fire. It's not been handled especially well. Um, it's it's something that the government likes to sort of talk up a lot because it thinks that it can sort of score points on it. But I don't think there's actually a, a lot of sort of desire to actually tackle it because it is a very thorny issue. I mean, you know, the, the idea was floated in the British media a couple of weeks ago that there might be a, a referendum on membership of the uh, ECHR. Um, which you can you can kind of tell that's the government kind of scraping the barrel for ideas of what to do, because no population in their right mind is going to vote to leave a convention on human rights, not without something much better already put in place. Um, we have to remember that as much as the government likes to talk tough on illegal migrants, it is a very pro-migration government. Uh, so it's not necessarily opposed to lots of people coming in. Uh, but I think what gets people's goat is the idea of, you know, that sort of British sense of 
fairness. They see people coming illegally in uh, small boats or whatever it is, and they look at it and they think that this isn't necessarily how the system is meant to work. This isn't fair. Now, very often what people say is that there are no safe legal routes. That's not true. It, it, that's not true. And you can point to the case of Ukrainians in this country show that that is not universally the case. There are some countries that it is much harder to get into the UK from than others. But broadly speaking, for refugees, the UK has been very generous towards Ukrainians, uh, which I think is correct. Again, it's been pretty generous, not as generous as it could have been, but pretty generous towards Afghans, which many people would argue it has much bigger duty towards given uh, the activities of the UK in their country. The same with Libya, Syria, Iraq. The thing is, when it comes to Albania, it is not a country that is in any way, shape or form in a similar situation to those. Now, of course, the issue when it comes to Albania is the presence of organized gangs operating out of Albania, but also across Europe. This has to be said. It is something that I think a lot of British people feel profound, very strongly about. You look at the number of Albanians in British prisons, for example, they are significantly overrepresented compared to the next largest group, which is Poles far more Polish people in the UK than there are Albanians. And when it, you then see lots of people coming into the UK from Albania, there is that sort of sense of, well, this is the system being gained. Now, the problem with this is, of course, as has been touched upon, there is an awful lot of human trafficking that goes on from Albania. That is one of the things in which criminal gangs can make money from is smuggling people illegally. But the point that you raised at the start there, which is that you know the laws around human trafficking, around smuggling uh, in Albania are not very strong. That many people in the UK, and I think many politicians in the UK would say correctly, well, that is an issue for the Albanian authorities. If you want to be accepted as a forward facing member of the international community, certainly in Europe, you need to clean out your own house first. British people, they have a lot of patience. They have a lot of tolerance. It is not indefinite. They're not very happy with how their government has handled migration or the refugee crisis. But that doesn't mean that they're going to look kindly on people, criminal gangs, gaming the system. You've also heard that children are going missing from asylum hotels, mainly Albanians. Um, and I'll be quite honest, the government doesn't really seem to care. What's your view on this? Should the government be doing more to help these children? Um, or is it a risk that people take when they come to the UK in an irregular manner? I mean, obviously, whenever you go to a new country, you take risks. That sort of has to be priced in. But when it comes to children, um, I think, you know, if a group of children sort of land in your country and they're unaccompanied, actually, I think sort of human decency takes over there and you say, OK, well, they might have come illegally, but they are children. Even if we plan to deport them, even if we plan to send them back, even if they have families to be sent back to, we can't just leave them un unattended. That's that's bizarre. But you only need to look actually about how broadly the immigration is dealt with in this country and also look to see how the foster care system in this country works and numerous other scandals that have happened involving children and local authorities in this country over the years to see this is not always something that is considered by authorities, by police, by anybody. Very often, something that needs to be borne in mind is that there is not a great deal of sort of cultural sensitivity in this country. We like to say that we're a multicultural society, but actually what that means broadly is not paying attention to minority cultures, just letting them get on with whatever they want in case we offend them. The problem with accommodation in this country is, as you've touched upon, it's largely hotel based because we don't have enough houses. We don't have safe houses. We don't even have enough social housing for hundreds of thousands of people born and raised in the UK. We don't have enough houses for people who don't need social housing, who are working and trying to get on the housing ladder. It is a crisis that underpins all aspects of British society. And this is just one of the many, perhaps more sad stories that is emanating from this. We don't have the secure facilities. We certainly don't have enough people trained to look after them, but we don't have the facilities to keep people in that aren't hotels. That is always going to mean that children that come to the UK are potentially more vulnerable than adults who have been trafficked. And this is something that needs to be borne in mind by people who consider maybe sending their children to the UK. I think that the only way that this can be dealt with is in the UK is significant investment into child protection services. That investment doesn't exist, though. This country is not as wealthy as it likes to imagine it is. Now for something a bit more lighthearted. By far, the most talked about event of the last week, apart from Enrique Iglesias, was the visit of the 42nd President of the United States, Bill Clinton, to Tirana. He arrived on Monday, stayed for two days, and was treated to a huge welcome ceremony on the main boulevard of Tirana. <laughs> Boulevard Yash Zurich Ministers Nichendra Tirana. 
në tre ditë të rënë ka pasë dy vizitë të famëshë. Një, Enrique Iglesias, dhe sot ishë prezident i Amerikës Bill Clinton. Êshtë një ditën shumë i bukur, sepse është vizitë parë në Shqipërië për Clinton. Clinton dhe Rama mbajtën fjallim dhe pati një qeremoni zjutarë. Rama e dha Clintonit një medali e ndëruar. Sigurija në Tiranë e shumë i lartë sot dhe ka shumë rrugët të mbulla sot dhe nese, por njërzit sot është shumë, shumë i lunte. Njërez ke flamuri shqipta dhe amerikan dhe gjëgjon muzik amerikan dhe një kankën nga manjonë në Albani për Bill Clinton. Pa t'i fjallën nga shumë shqipta me emrin Clinton, Bill Clinton dhe Hillary nga Kosovë. Dhe Bill Clinton është shumë, shumë, shumë i lumë të sot. Ka Amerikan, shqiptare, diplomat, ambasador, politikan, gazetaret, prifti, hoxhe dhe unë. Shqiptare të duen Amerikan dhe janë të lumë të përshohin një ish prezidentin sot, këtu në Tiranë. It was quite something, and the former president looked both overjoyed and at times a little overwhelmed. But for those of us on the outside, it may be a bit confusing as to why there was such excitement over his visit. This immense love for Clinton is actually rooted in the fact he was US president during the 1998-1999 Kosovo-Serbia war, and he was instrumental in bringing the conflict to an end paving the way for Kosovo's liberation and subsequent independence. He's considered something of a hero by Albanians for supporting their plight and cause during one of the continent's most testing times since the Second World War. But I wanted to hear from some Americans in Albania what they thought of the former president's visit. First up is Amanda Kalekas, an educator in a private school. Amanda, with regards to Bill Clinton's visit this week, did you find it a bit surreal or can you understand the excitement of Albanians? I don't think that it's surreal. I think that it's absolutely understandable in light of the current situation in northern Kosovo. Um, Clinton was such a key player in the push for an autonomous, independent state. And I feel like the show of partnership between the countries and his message of de-escalation is going to be better received because of his obvious support in the past. Whereas if we had some other politician come and speak and say the same things, perhaps it would not have been received in the same way. And I have to ask, what is your view on the level of patriotism for the US from Albania at a time, I think we can say the US is struggling with social and political issues internally? I think that it's understandable. I think that uh, in 92, 93, when we had the initial diaspora, so many people went to the United States and you have such a large Albanian community in the United States that it's absolutely understandable that people here look favorably to our country. Um, and we have very good relations with Albania and continue to have where often we don't with other places. So. I think that it's it's understandable that 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 relationship and partnership is celebrated. And lastly, how do Albanians react to you when you say you're from the US? People have been very, very kind, very kind. Um, I really enjoy living here. It's an absolutely beautiful country. And I think that it's I've lived in four continents at this point in my career. And this is the place that I have felt the safest really, in terms of personal safety, just walking down the street. I really do feel safe and I don't feel uh, that anybody has any negative sentiments towards me because of my nationality, because of my religion or, or anything. I feel like Albanians are very tolerant of, of foreigners in general and uh, they're very welcoming, whether you're a refugee or just an expat. I also spoke to Sam Lopez, a friend of mine and a long-term resident in Albania. Sam, what did you think of Bill Clinton's visit? And have you had a warm welcome in Albania when you say you're American? I like Bill Clinton. I think Bill Clinton's uh, uh, a, a popular president because he's um, casual, low-key, friendly, um, 
I would say, I would say he's apolitical, but I guess he's not. That's just my opinion. Uh, regardless, I, I, I think he's always scored high in regards to, to popularity. Um, other than his um, one indiscretion. Uh, regardless, um, me as a uh, being welcomed as an American, I'd say mostly yes, uh, and sometimes uh, you know they so they don't really care. <laughs> Were you surprised to see such patriotism from Albanians? I didn't see the ceremony, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I think uh, uh, Americans as uh, as a whole love. Uh, um, uh, uh, celebrations and uh, the the pomp and circumstance. I think they love that sort of thing. It's uh, it's all a show, and and I think Americans like to put on a show. Uh, that their American show is completely different from the British show. Um, but hey, you know it's uh, Americans are more casual and and Brits are more uh, restricted. Restricted. So I'm not surprised that that uh, there was uh, a big celebration with with Bill Clinton. Did he play his sax? <laughs> That's all for this week. As always, you can follow Inside Albania on Euronews Albania on Saturdays on our YouTube channel and across all major podcasting platforms. Mira Pavsim.